Welcome to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you burn fat, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hey there, it's Debbie Potts, the host of the Low Carb Athlete Podcast, and today I have Elle Russ on the show today. She's a best-selling author, TV film writer, and a master coach. She's the author of the well-known book, Confident as F-U-K, The Paleo Thyroid Solution, and The Manifestation Journal, which I'm all about manifesting things. She is also the screenwriter of the award-winning documentary, Headhunt Revisited. Elle hosted Mark Sisson's popular Primal Blueprint podcast for seven years with over 500 episodes and 20 million downloads. That's a lot. She launched the Elle Rush Show in 2021, and now she coaches people all over the world in a variety of areas. She helps clients accomplish personal and professional goals, creates better business and personal relationships, has more fun, improves their health, and manifests unknown possibilities. If you'd like to learn more, head to lrest.com, and you can follow her on social media, lrest.com is her website, as I said, Instagram is lrest, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So check her out and enjoy our conversation today about thyroid health and all things healthy to be fit and healthy from the inside out. That's my mission, to help you help yourself and avoid going through what myself and many others of us practitioners have had happen, burnout and a breakdown of our body systems, metabolic chaos, also known HPA axis dysfunction, adrenal fatigue, whatever you want to call it, you don't need to go through all that that I went through. So learn from us and hopefully you can take some notes and let me know if you have questions, comments, and feedback after the show. Just send a little message, debbiepotts.net. Chat soon. All right. I am ready to talk to the L. Russ. She's author, podcaster, speaker, coach, does a lot of everything. And I finally connected with her. I I always hear about you, Elle, through my mutual friends, Brad Kearns, and I see you on the Primal Blueprint. You have a new podcast we'll talk about, and you've just been in the Primal Health Coach scene and really helping other athletes, females get healthier from the inside out, kind of correlates with what I'm trying to do is get people to improve health and performance, but look at their future self. So I am happy to have you as a guest on my show to talk shop. Thanks for having me on. So talk about your journey in a nutshell. I know it's a big one hour show, but what we can talk about how you got to be where you are now and specializing in, you know, health and the thyroid expert side of things. Yeah. So like a lot of people who are authors in the health industry, they struggled with something and they had to figure it out, you know? And so then they, they, so I am the same. So all of the best selling thyroid books are written by patients. There's only two others that I recommend other than mine. And I'll mention them now because those authors helped me also save my own life. So aside from my book, the paleo thyroid solution, I also only recommend Janie Bothorpe's book, stop the thyroid madness and her website is probably the best website for thyroid in general. And then, um, Paul Robinson's book recovering with T3 and he's out of England. So these two authors, um, really helped me also helped me save my own life. Um, but basically all the three of us are, we're all in the same boat. We had to do it on our own. We couldn't find a doctor to figure it out. And this is usually what happens with lots of people who go through a health issue. So long story short, um, I athleticized and overworked myself out probably into this, but I can, we cannot say what the actual cause was. All I can say is I can look at my life and what it was like. And so Many years ago, the zone was very popular and I am in Hollywood and I'm also an actress voiceover person, been on TV and film and stuff. So when I first came here to pursue that, I knew I had to be fit. You know, you nowadays it's great. There's more representative normal body types on television and I love seeing that. But back when I was doing it and really pursuing it as an ingenue, it was very clear that you had to be like a two. Mm 
size two. Like, you know, it was just clear. You'd hear casting directors on the phone with agents and they would say, you know, uh, your client's at an eight and I need her at a two. Like literally you would hear this. So you just knew, you know? So I was trying to do what I thought was right by like working out all the time and eating in the way, you know, and, and when I look back, what was I doing? I was over exercising, doing chronic cardio. And I was also eating sort of a low carb, low fat diet and trying to do like zone and none of the stuff worked. I had total eating disorder stuff was hypoglycemic, freaking out after three hours of not eating, always felt like I had little meals, never felt fun to have just like a big meal. Um, sometimes I'd starve myself all day and then eat a meal, but I wasn't fat adapted. So that was very painful. <laughs> and I didn't know. I didn't know. Everyone was doing the zone then. No one knew what was going on. There was no such thing as paleo. There were no podcasts. I, I was clueless. So um, I, that can be part of this chronic cardio journey as well. And so did I overexhaust my adrenals and deplete some nutrients? And then of course was not being satiated because I wasn't having enough fat. Maybe sure. All of the above. I used to be a cigarette smoker. Could that have affected it? Possibly. I ended up having a selenium deficiency at one point. Was that possibly a culprit? Sure. That's related to thyroid. Um, there's so many things. There's a whole soup of things, but there's no one in my family that has it. There's nothing about, you know, my family history that would say that I would have this other than the fact that I am from the Midwest. And so the Midwest was once called the goiter belt, a goiter being an enlarged thyroid that looks like sometimes it can go to the size of a basketball. And they call it the goiter belt because we had no sort of um, iodine in the soil from not being near a sea. And so what they did back in the day was they started to iodize salt and that helped people with the goiters. Da, 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 da. Um, so basically I got horror. So what happened was, is I'm fit. I'm looking good. I'm suffering inside. I, I clearly I'm thinking in my head, oh no, in order to be fit and thin, clearly I have to struggle mentally and physically. I thought, are other people suffering? She's skinny. Is she suffering too? Is she opening up the fridge every three hours? Is she freaking out all the time? Is she feeling like she's got an obsessive eating issue? you know, is this what has to be done in order to get this body? Like, I didn't know there was another way. I had no idea. And at the time there really wasn't, no one was telling you there was another way. So I continued the struggle throughout this time though, I had gotten hypothyroidism. And so I started to get very fat, bloated. My hair was falling out. There's over 30, 40 symptoms in my book, which is right behind me. Um, and I had all of them. I was an absolute mess of a person and I struggled for, to try to figure out what was wrong with me. And everyone misdiagnosed me or didn't test my thyroid correctly. No one knew it was up. Finally, I did what a lot of people do who solved their problem. I persevered. I was like, I am going to figure this out. I don't care what I, I, at one point I was like, if I have to fly to an ashram in fucking India, like, I don't give a shit what I have to do. Like, I'm going to do it. I, I can't live like this. And I went through 20, like two dozen endocrinologists, doctors, people in LA, they all didn't know what they're talking about. And I'm in Los Angeles, like the best place in the world for doctors. I'm going to see like famous doctors that were writing on Suzanne Summers hormones book. And, you know, they're costing like $600 just for one visit. And they still couldn't help me. And so who helped me? Fellow thyroid patients. Yeah. Who knows? Janie, Janie <laughs> Bothorpe. And she had a Yahoo group at the time. She didn't even have a book or anything back in 2006, but there was this wonderful. And I, to this day, they still have it. And I recommend it in my free thyroid guide. There's a bunch of free, uh, like people like me who know what they're talking about, who are for free offering to look at labs and help you kind of figure this out and get you on the road to solving the problem. And so, uh, literally I just could cry thinking about the, the kindness of their hearts to sit there and moderate a forum every day or several days a week to do this for people. And they steered me in a direction that then allowed me to sort of help me save myself. So I actually dosed myself back to health, the first bout of hypothyroidism I had, and then I was doing great. And I was on thyroid hormone for a couple of years. And then I started to get symptoms again. And I didn't even think that it could be thyroid because I was like, well, I'm on thyroid hormone replacement, but all of the symptoms were horrific. It turns out then I had a second bout of hypothyroidism called a reverse T3 problem, which sucks, but glad I went through it so that I can help people get through it because it's on the rise. And I won't go into the details of that right now. Happy to talk about the details later. So then I met Mark Sisson and um, that, you know, changed my life. He's been my mentor for 10 years. I worked for him for 10 years, just recently left, but you know, uh, he sold his company to Kraft Heinz and, mm -hmm. um, you know, he was just, he, he's an amazing person as, as you know, and same with Brad Kearns and they really mentored me. They taught me everything that I needed to know about ancestral health and paleo primal nutrition. And one of the things I realized when I started to work for Mark, I had not learned about this yet. And I remember 
working with Mark and his wife, Carrie, very closely at their house a lot. And I remember thinking, these guys are like 20 years older than me. They look way better than me. And they don't seem to be stressing out and they're not working out all the time. And I don't, they don't think like they have eating disorders. Like, what the fuck are they doing? Like, you know, like maybe I should. And then I was like, maybe I should read the guy's book who I'm working for. No, nah, maybe yeah. that you know, they <laughs> literally just got the job with him, had no idea who it was. And then I, I actually, it was not only just reading his book, it was watching a seminar that Mark used to do, a two-hour seminar on the Primal Blueprint, where he really explains all of this stuff. And I think hearing it, and this is why I do so many interviews on this, because I think that's a great way of learning. Watching him and listening to him speak about it, it all clicked. I get goosebumps right now thinking about it. I probably watched that two-hour seminar like five times. And it all clicked and I realized, oh my God, I've still on this old paradigm of this over-exercising, this chronic cardio, this carbohydrate dependency type of dietary lifestyle paradigm. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I switched to paleo primal, all of my food obsessions went away. That's not to say I don't indulge some time and go overboard with sugar and other shit like most people. Of course I'm human, but I don't, then I'm not freaking out like wanting it for days on end or back in that obsessive mind. Mm -hmm. And the one success story that's always the thoroughfare on Mark's Daily Apple, Mark Sisson's blog, when they have a success story every week, is people will be like, oh, I lost 100 pounds or I cured my skin disease, all of these great things. But the thoroughfare is, oh my God, and I'm not obsessed with food anymore. Yeah, I don't yeah. think about food anymore. I just didn't know there was another way to be satiated and then also be in a fat burning state. Turns out this is the best way to go. So once I discovered that I started to go paleo primal and I started to notice the difference in thyroid, meaning I was able to cut my medication more than in half. I became more metabolically efficient. Then I became more meta, you know, insulin sensitive. And then as a result, I became more T3 efficient meaning more efficient at using the thyroid hormone, which is why I was needing less and less and less. So not only did paleo primal help me clean up my life. And of course I did lots of other things like heavy metals tests, and nutrient optimization and blah, blah, blah. But that really started me on the course where I wasn't hungry and tired after working out anymore. I didn't feel like I had to work out so hard and so long and all of this stressful shit that you have to be in if you're a carbohydrate dependent sugar burner. And so it, what an easier life and not worrying about eating after working out because you're not going to catabolize your muscles because you're not a sugar burner anymore. So I transitioned to being what we call in the paleo world, a fat burner, and it totally changed my life. And then I approached Mark and I said, Hey man, uh, because people for years had said, you should write a thyroid book. You know, so much. And I was like, uh, you know, what can I say that hasn't maybe already been said? Mm -hmm. Granted, I'm one of the only authors on uh, who experienced a reverse T3 problem and had to go on T3 only, which is rare. So that was one thing I experienced that makes me a little bit different, but really finding this paleo primal ancestral connection with thyroid. It's not a gimmick. Uh, someone might look at my book and go, oh, I get it. You got fat because you had hypothyroidism. And so now you do paleo to lose the weight. Yeah. Okay, sure. That That is absolutely one of the benefits. Um, however, it's really truly a benefit because the way the paleo primal ancestral nutrition works, it's really the ultimate in adrenal management and glucose management. And those things go hand in hand with how your thyroid hormones are metabolized, et cetera. So it is the perfect sister to whether your thyroid's working normally and pumping out the right amount and it, you want everything to get to where you need to go. And it's also the perfect scenario for someone who's taking thyroid hormones like I am to make sure that they're getting to where they need to go. And so when I pitched this to Mark, he said, you know, I've been wanting to write a thyroid, I published a thyroid book for a long time. This sounds great. And then we did it. And it's been a bestseller for years now. Um, and so that's sort of, that's a, a long lecture winded way of sort of <laughs> telling the story of how I arrived here. So accidentally becoming an expert because I expert because I had no choice but to fix myself twice in 10 years. So twice in 10 years, I was left in the dust by doctors, famous doctors, endocrinologists, people, they literally threw up their hands. And that's when I realized that 99% of the doctors in the world are uninformed on this topic. Um, I coach people all over the world from Saudi Arabia to India to, it doesn't matter where they are. It's the same thing. So we look at that and we're like, well, this, this is brutal because Here's the truth about hypothyroidism. It's very easy to fix. The only problem is the uninformed doctors not understanding what labs to take, how to interpret the labs, and then how to treat the situation based on the labs. Yeah. Now, they may get somewhere down the line right. They may test correctly, not interpret it right. They may test correctly, interpret it right, not treat right. So yeah. you have all of these levels of idiocy, really, it just, it's just ignorance with doctors. And so 
I shouldn't have, you know, like I shouldn't be the one out here telling everyone this. It should be, it should be MDs all over the place. Yeah. Um, but that is the problem. So people will never get well. And uh, I'll close out this little mini intro lecture with saying that 200 plus million people in the world have it. It's only one thyroid hormone is the number one prescription in the US and always has been. That's just one prescription for one brand name of a thyroid hormone. 25 plus million Americans have it. 60% are undiagnosed. One in eight uh, women will get it in their lifetime. It's disproportionately a women's issue, but that also means men are going to be discounted um, when they have or exhibiting symptoms. Or a guy might get low testosterone and the doctor is like, oh, well, we just need to give you testosterone. And that's not really the case. It's thyroid that's affecting the testosterone. And I'll stop there because it's so long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm smiling the whole time because it's, it's so, you know, as I'm a F nutritional therapy practitioner and FDN practitioner. So we investigate, you know, the why, look at the big picture, put the missing pieces of the puzzle together because there is not one size fits all. There's not a medication as a band-aid to just fix a problem. Doesn't solve the why. Also my journey that I shared in my book, life is not a race. It is a journey is because I did, you know, I didn't do 20 doctors, but I saw eight to 10 different practitioners and experts and similar for my fatigue and sudden weight gain and total burnout and breakdown from racing and, and too much stress in life and yes. doing too much of everything. And so that's why I feel like on the show, it, it's the low carb athlete, but it's about, you know, burning fat, optimized health and performance, but also longevity, make sure what you're doing now isn't impacting your health. You know, are we fit and healthy from the inside out? And I think so many people that are athletes train and don't do all that we talk about as, you know, primal health coaches do and all of us in the practitioner world to really work on what I call the holistic method. And, you know, your is your journey is a great example of low thyroid and looking at the why, you know, why did you have low thyroid and look at the big picture but point is, I think so many athletes don't put those pieces of the puzzle together because they think I train, I'm strong. I can do this race, this event and do well. Well, I, wa I was an athlete. I mean, and I yeah. am an athlete, but even at, at that point, I was probably working out every day, like an athlete who was training. Exactly. I was doing it the wrong way. Yeah. That's the problem. I mean, even Brad Kearns has run into this issue. Uh, you know, he's talked about it publicly. I'm not spilling any tea here. Um, but when he was doing his keto experiment for the first time, when we were writing the book with Mark, he, uh, he made a, an accidental mistake. Sometimes, especially when you go keto, let's say, or too low carb, yeah. your appetite is suppressed, which is a wonderful, beautiful thing when you especially have had a food addiction, but his appetite was so suppressed. He actually didn't realize. And, and then on that, he was playing speed golf mm -hmm. and he was having so much fun he didn't realize he was actually overworking out and probably not getting enough nutrients. And we were talking one day and his testosterone was going down and some other things. And I was like, I was like, Hey Brett, like how many calories are you eating? Because I think maybe you're sending the wrong, you're, maybe there's a starvation signal being sent because your appetite's so suppressed. And he was like, Oh shit. You know what? I yeah. think. And, and then over working out for the keto diet that he had adopted. Once he changed that his testosterone right, right back up his energy and his recovery was all good. So, you know, there's sometimes small tweaks people need to make. I think, um, here's the truth. Uh, when you are an athlete, you have to be very careful because the signals you're sending through, lifestyle diet and exercise could be the signal that you're in trouble and in your danger. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, the thyroid feedback loop will start to go, Whoa, whoa, whoa. we're not going to pump out any more of this stuff. Cause they're running from danger. They're not satiated. They're not getting enough food. So we're not going to give them erections in the morning. If they're a guy, we're not, we're going to give her a miscarriage. If she's a girl, they can't afford to have kids right now. It's trying to save your life. The feedback loop gets the information and it's trying to go, oh, okay. Because, because it is releasing a metabolic, like the only fat burner we have. So the active thyroid hormone is called T3. Just as an example, now, if you Google T3, it'll be different. 
when I was Googling T3 many years ago, all that would come up was bodybuilding websites. And I remember being like, what the hell is going on? So I looked into it. Turns out bodybuilders, when they need to shed as much fast as humanly possible before an event, they will jam themselves with what I take every day to stay alive. They will jam themselves with this fat burning thyroid hormone, overtake their thyroid, very stupid, uh, possibly dangerous, really dumb. They do that. And then they take some other things to offset the catabolic nature of that too much of that thyroid hormone. And so that just goes to show you. So it is a very potent fat burner, but it's also like throwing gasoline onto a fire. So your body, if it senses fires, it's like, we're not, let's dial this back. And so you could be overworking and overtraining yourself into a situation. And here's, here's the shitter about this <clears throat> back when it happened to me, I was trying to do everything I, in the pursuit of health and fitness. I became ill. Yeah. Yeah. I say that all the time. I was doing all the right things, but still caused total dysfunction. That's what I keep trying to tell everyone that's fasting too much, yes. doing too low carb, not eating enough. Like you said, you know, it's so easy not to eat for hours once you're fat adapted and you're like, I'm not hungry. And then I work out. I'm, you know, I'm not hungry afterwards. I don't want to eat beforehand. They end up being like fragile, you know, not eating enough calories and getting the nutrition. And I can see that in what happened to me years ago. And I still have to course correct because it's so easy just to like, Oh, I'm just going to wait to eat. But then as an athlete, you know, if you're trying to get all that protein in <laughs> and spread it out 20, 30 grams at a time, and and you're trying to do fasting because everyone else is doing fasting or you're trying to do keto and OMAD. And I think so many people are causing this total dysfunction to their hormones. They and are. And it's like, day. yeah. And it's also just like, so if you're out there, stop identifying with this shit. Okay. Like, like I get like, if you're keto, that's great. You're hungry for an apple, eat the fucking apple. Please don't not eat the apple. Yeah. Okay. Like your body's telling you something, you know, <clears throat> I'm an intermittent faster. I hate breakfast. I hate eating anytime before like 2 PM pretty much. But there are some days, like I live in an area, I, I live in the middle of the mountains. Let's say like two weeks ago, I got woken up by a pe honking peacock at like four in the morning and okay, I'm up. So now my day is thrown off a bit. And you know what? I'm not happy about it. Cause I know I'll probably be hungry earlier and I don't like it. Cause in my mind, I don't like to eat before a certain time, yeah. but when that hunger shows up, even though I don't logically like it, I eat anyway. So you still have to follow the intuition. I don't get hungry at 1130 that day and go, but I'm don't eat till two. I go, ah, shit, I hate the way this day worked out, but I got to eat some meat right now or whatever it is. So you have to still follow intuition. And then also too, if you're Okay. Not that there aren't low carb athletes out there that are successful, but <clears throat> I think there's, there's room for cycling. I don't think any, look, our ancestors did not stay in a ketogenic state 24 seven all year round. Um, it's not to say that you couldn't, and you might have to, if you have a traumatic brain injury or you have epilepsy, there's other really amazing therapeutic uses for being keto and reasons to stay keto all the time. Yeah. However, that's not really how life worked then. I don't think that's very ancestral to be keto all the time, to intermittent fast all the time. You have to switch it up occasionally. Yeah. Um, and so whether that's because you woke up too early or late that day and the thing is off, just honor whatever it is. Once you get fat adapted, you kind of, uh, once you get fat adapted and assume you don't have any other underlying metabolic shit like hypothyroidism, then you can get fat adapted pretty quickly within 21 days. And you start to really understand what your body needs at that point. If you're a sugar burner, you're never going to know what your body needs. You're going to think your body needs sugar. So you have to get fat adapted first, which, yeah. you know, of course takes 21, 30 days or so, uh, a little bit longer for others. And, um, so, but I have just also realized too, when you're exhausted, so the adrenal glands are really important and everyone with hypothyroidism usually gets adrenal fatigue. I've had it twice. It's a disaster. You can get it without having hypothyroidism and which, which is what we call like burnout, right? This is going to cause so many problems and it also can really F up your thyroid to have a, to have an adrenal issue. So let's say, you know, you're an athlete, you're training, but you're like freaking exhausted one day, but you keep pushing to train, stopping that asshole. Like really guys, you can't. And I would just suggest reading primal endurance or going through the primal endurance program and started, start to try to become a fat adapted athlete so that a, you don't spend all your time training and you're doing it in the right way. That's not going to damage your body. I mean, listen, you, Brad, Mark, all these people that were endurance athletes that they, uh, I've not heard one that hasn't regretted something about what it did to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Why well, we, <clears throat> excuse me. 
I have a, I, I keep thinking of this intuitive, I and I did a website domain for it so I can snag it, but intuitive fueling and intuitive training and it would be racing. But I was just listening to this podcast yesterday. I think it was William Cole or he has a book is intuitive fasting. And it's all that same thing. Like how can we get fat adapted and teach people to actually listen to their body when to break that fast, when you actually to eat, when your body is saying, Hey, I need little carbs. They're not evil. And I think we find that, you know, the people giving the keto directions out there saying 50 grams carbs a day, you know, some people go 20, but that's not for the athlete that's actually exercising every day. And I think we have to take those guidelines and then tweak them as an individual. But like you're saying, listen, if I need to take a rest day, take a rest day and not push through it. I think so many of us driven, ambitious type A, triple A's, Brad, they say athletes push through that because we think we're a wimp or, you know, we're not strong enough if we don't follow through with us on my training schedule that day, or, you know, I'm just not hardcore enough. And I, I think that's where people get really broken is that they don't pay attention to those red flags. They don't honor the messages their body's sending them, knowing when to course correct and change it for that day. It's crazy. I mean, there are so many ways to do, to be an athlete and incorporate carbs and the cycling. And there's so many different ways to do this. I don't, I, I don't know of any athletes out there that would suggest a ketogenic program nonstop 24 seven maybe for one race or to try it out for something, but not like overall. I mean, you really have to, again, you have to honor your body, your energy. And also too, if you're, you have to watch your neurotransmitters, you know, like if you're really so low carb for so long, that could be screwing up dopamine and some other things. So you just want to make sure you got to check in with it. It's like anything else, you know, um, you're going off the reservation a bit. So you need to check in maybe more than others. It's no different than a vegan or vegetarian. It's like, you can make that choice. That's great. Make sure you're getting your B12. Make sure you get an amino acid. Same thing if you're keto. Okay, make sure you get your salt. Maybe you're eating enough calories. You know, make sure you're not too satiated. Make sure you're not eating more fat than you're burning because you'll get fat on a low carb diet. I mean, that's very classic and it happened to me. It totally yeah. happened to me. When I first started paleo primal, I don't know what I was doing. I did keto. I was eating like way more fat than I was burning. I was getting fat. I was like, what the hell's going on? And I just had to kind of really look at the actual amounts. You know, it's so tough because fat's so nutrient dense. So like a little piece visually is a lot versus the protein and, and carbs, which can fill up a plate, right? So most of the time we don't need to pour fat on things. Um, yeah. you are usually getting enough fat if you're eating fatty meats and if you're not, you can add fat. But I think that that's also been an issue too. I want to bring up just cause I've made that mistake. I've eaten way too much fat on a low carb diet and have had to dial it black. I think we back, I think, you know, you talk to some people on their, their quote bulletproof coffee that they have in the morning. I talked to one client years ago and I remember I go, well, what's, what do you, what's your fat coffee? Like, tell me what's in it. And she said two tablespoons of butter and two tablespoons of MCT. And I thought, where's your, aren't you having like an ass blowout every morning? Like that would kill me. And for those that don't know, you got to go easy with MC2 oil, yeah. especially because it can give you total disaster, disaster pants. pants. Bro uh, Brock used to say disaster 100 pants. 100% yeah. disaster pants. And so, um, but here's the thing. So that's like what, four or 500 calories of fat that she's eating at the beginning of the day. You're never going to lose any fat if you're, <laughs> and she wasn't like an athlete or anything burning that. So fat is such a long sustaining thing. And I think what I found over time is that I've probably, if anything, been overdoing fat consumption mm -hmm. than anything else, you know? And so I think that's mm -hmm. the one piece people understand the low carb, they can understand the high protein. It, the mitigating what fat content is right for you is a whole nother thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's for people that want to get fat adapted, if you want to start to intermittent fast, start off by just eating three meals a day like you normally do. Okay. Just start there and make it paleo and clean. Then what you can do is one morning, hopefully you wake up and you won't be hungry one morning because that's usually what happens when you get fat adapted. But in order to push it, you would skip that breakfast and to kind of do a kid gloves, baby step into fasting. Let's say you're going to try to be like, okay, I'm not going to eat anything till 12. You know, my window is going to be 12 to eight. Then maybe you need half to one teaspoon of MCT oil in the morning there a little bit that can stay you over. It can help you get to noon without freaking out. It'll really help your brain. And then it kind of just becomes natural. So if you're wondering about how to get into intermittent fasting, uh, that's, that's the way I would kind of ease and do it. If you're coming off being a sugar burner. 
So what are your thoughts on exercising and fasting and eating? I exercise, I exercise fasted almost all the time. Is it low heart rate workouts? If it's harder, high intense workout, do you do any? I never eat usually before a workout. However, again, back to the intuition. Mm -hmm. There have been times when I know I'm going to go on a really long hike with a friend. I know how long that's going to take. I'm not hungry beforehand, but there's something I'm feeling like I need something. I feel like my body needs something. Now in that situation, I might do a little sip of MCT oil, or I might just take a little bite of the steak from last night, like a little something. I might take some spirulina spirulina pills. I love energy bits. And I might take some of those with like a little piece of salmon, just a little something, a little something, something, even though I'm not hungry, but there's something in me that goes, ah, you might be on the other side of it, not so happy. So just have a little something now. So, but in general, I do not work out uh, at all with any food in my body, usually. If I do, it would just be probably collagen, mm -hmm. collagen and water, maybe collagen and a green drink or something like that. Um, but it's rare. It's rare. Mm -hmm. Well, I find it's interesting trying to research is it's hard to get any research studies, of course, on females and fasting and exercising, but it's really that N equals one experiment, what works for you and just try it out and see, okay, how's yeah. my performance that day and how's my energy? Because I think so many people, I keep saying this on the show that a lot of people are not intentionally bragging, but maybe a little bit on their social media posts, like, oh, I could work out fasted. I didn't eat for 48 hours and I did two workouts, or I was able to go for a three hour run and have nothing but water. And I think I was wondering, like, are we, when do we know that, you know, intuition, if we're doing more damage than good, could have we been a little, I think the signals are there. I mean, I think once, yeah, I think once you're fat adapted, I mean, I think the signals will come in that, like, for example, I'll feel an emptiness of some kind somewhere that kind of says you need something for your brain. That's yeah. usually the thing. It's not like my stomach's growling. I'm hungry. And I'm usually not hungry if I eat before working out. It's usually just something that goes, eh, it's an intuition, like eh, a little something. Um, and again, maybe you don't know that, but here's the thing. If you're not starving, do you eat? I would say no. But then again, like, for example, if I were going to get on a flight tomorrow, I've done this before. Let's say uh, I was going to get on a flight. I have to leave at 5 a.m. to catch an eight o'clock flight to go to Hawaii. And it's a five hour flight. Um, I've done this before where I'll go to the airport this morning. I am really not hungry. In fact, grossed out at food at the time. All I want is coffee, but I go up to the burger thing and I get one grass fed patty and I shove it in my face medicinally. Why? Because I know that by the time I get there, then I get my bags, blah, blah, blah. Now it's going to be 10, 12 hours. And I don't want to be in a situation where there's no good food around and I'm stressed out about it. Yeah. That burger, that patty kept me sustained all the way to Hawaii, the drive to the place, settling in, unpacking. And then in the evening, going, it was like 10, 12 hours of satiation. And I knew it. And that's why I ate that damn thing because I knew on the plane, I wouldn't be able to. So, and, uh, so that's a strategy. Yeah. Plan. You know, that was just a strategy. And meanwhile, everyone else on the plane, two hours in Pringles freaking out, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so again, like there are times when you just gauge the day and you go, would it be better for me to just eat something now? and just be satiated the whole freaking day, or then risk possibly being somewhere and not being able to get the kind of satiation I want or the quality that I want. And it's not that I was worried about falling off a cliff because I'm not a sugar burner. I would have kicked into ketosis at some point and I would have been fine. It was just more about my comfortability. And again, maybe nothing would have happened, but it didn't hurt me to have the burger. Yeah. No, that's how I, like, for example, I just was telling our group page we have on a Saturday bike ride, if I'm going to go ride three, four hours and we start maybe because it's winter time, I'm going to start, you know, maybe at 9 a.m. And I don't want to, I don't often like eating when I'm on the bike unless I have to, and I'll take something this case, but usually I don't even take anything this time of year, but I've been experimenting, have a little something, add a little more MC2 oil and make it collagen in my coffee or add my little mushroom mud water and try that. But you know, my the old me would have gone, oh, I can't have anything and be so strict and push through it. Yes. It's like, hey, I'm going to do it fasted. But now I know, like, I should just have a little something because I don't want to worry about having something yes. for a three hour bike ride. And so plan ahead and based on that workout. And plus, if it's a flat ride versus a hilly ride where we are, then I know my heart rate's going to go 
out of fat burning range and I might need a little something. So listen. exactly. And that's actually great. Just some collagen, unflavored collagen powder and some MCT oil and some coffee is an amazing combination for a sustenance without ingest like you don't want food in your belly when you're yeah you don't want to like chew food or have a taste really and you're like let me just suck down some nutrition and that's where you know protein powders and you know collagen powders are great uh sometimes i look i love vegetables uh but there are times i'm like i don't want to eat any vegetables i just again you know i I look at the day and i'm like i don't feel like it so i supplement with green powders you know what i mean i mean it's great. Energy, those energy bits and the recovery bits are really good to throw in there. I love those. I always eat the energy bits. Like I'll, even if, again, if I'm feeling like I need a little something before a long hike, I'll just take some energy bits, you know, and that always seems to be enough. It's just even that. Can you chew them though? I can't chew them. Like she told me what to have them chew them. Like you're eating nuts. I'm like, (laughs) well, the spirulina tablets are actually sweet and tasty. The, the recovery bits are not, um, but they get, they stain and they get in every, you know, so it's like, if you're out, you would not want to chew the bits. So yeah, I swallow (laughs) them. I swallow them. If if I was in a bind though, I would chew them up somewhere, but yeah, then you have like green stuff and you're, yeah, not good. Hey, so with your book and for thinking of the athlete and the female athlete or anyone struggling with thyroid, low thyroid issues, it's paleo and paleo ketogenic. And I know, you know, we want people to go read the book, but the well, it's really paleo, paleo thyroid solution. I'm arguing for a paleo paradigm in general. Um, and again, even though we say paleo is high fat, moderate protein, low carb, uh, it could be moderate fat, moderate protein, low carb. Uh, there is a ketogenic option in there. Like, you know, it shows you like what that's like. If you're an athlete though, if you're struggling, first of all, if you're worried about any kind of issues, go get your thyroid tested. Yeah. Just but your- a full test, not the TSH that. The yeah. You do a full comprehensive test. test. And, and by the way, anyone could just go to my website, click the free stuff tab or go to Instagram. It's on like free stuff highlight. And it's my free thyroid guide. I list all the tests, what time of the day to get it to, to test them. How, if you're fasted, uh, how to find a doctor in your state that might know what they're doing. Um, you know, how to assess suss out a doctor's office with some pointed questions to see if maybe they are a little bit more knowledgeable none of it's foolproof, but you know, better than, uh, you can really waste a lot of time with these docs. So that's always there for everyone. You could just go and get those tests. You don't even have to read my book for that, but if you'd like to, you, you can, of course. Um, but I put that out there for free for everyone. Yeah. You're going to need six main tests to see, is your thyroid screwed up? I'll list them very quickly here. It's TSH free T3, free T4, reverse T3. And then you always want to rule out whether or not you have Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune form of hypothyroidism. And there's two antibody tests for that. Most doctors don't know that. And they only think there's one and you could be positive for one and not the other or both. So you have to get both. Uh, One is called TPO antibody stands for thyroid peroxidase. And the other is TG antibody. And that stands for thyroglobulin. So those are the six main TSH, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, TPO, and TG. You get those. Now, are there a million other tests to see what caused this thing? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, totally. But if you just want to like, here's the least amount of money I have to spend on blood work to just go, is something wrong with my thyroid? And then if something is off, then yeah, you can go down the road of going, what caused it? Do I have a deficiency here? Blah, 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 blah. I always still suggest that if you can do that comprehensive thyroid panel and get ferritin, which is iron storage, or do a comprehensive iron panel along with it, that is key because often people with hypothyroidism will be extremely low in iron. Long story short, it just, um, when you're hypo, everything's slow, sluggish, which is why you're freezing all the time. You're constipated. You have no metabolism. And so, uh, so when this happens, sorry, I lost my thought here on the testing. Let me get it back. My brain, yeah. maybe I need, maybe I need some MCTL. <laughs> What's I going to say about that? Um, so the low, low thyroid getting other tests done. Oh yeah. So Again, um, the iron storage, the thing that's very important about this is most people, the reason most people are deficient in like vitamin D and iron and some other nutrients is that when you're hypothyroid, you really kind of can't hold on to them. So you could be eating like chicken liver every day and your body like, will be like, great, goodbye. It doesn't hold on to it. So we always want to, if you can add like an iron comprehensive panel to those six tests, or at least ferritin, that is very helpful. And the reason is, is because if that is really crappy, you have to supplement with iron. If you don't supplement with iron and get the iron lads up, your own thyroid hormones can't get to where they need to go. Or if you have to take thyroid hormone replacement like me, then those things, those 
uh, hormones won't get to where they need to go properly. It's almost like you can imagine iron or iron storage is the conveyor belt of which to the bringer of the thing to the cell. I mean, sort of a yeah. two-year-old way of describing that, but. <laughs> and what other, do you like to look when you're, how do you coach people? Do you like to look at multiple labs to look at just the thyroid? No, I mean, I'll look, I'll look at, at everything, but basically we focus on the thyroid stuff and then the things related to thyroid and seeing like where there's indications. So some, it's very rare, but sometimes people come to me and I'm like, oh, you don't have a thyroid problem, but I think it might be that, or, you know, like, oh, well, your thyroid is, again, sometimes it's not the thyroid and it's something that's related to it. Oftentimes it's an iron thing. Sometimes it's so dumb. Sometimes someone, all their issues are, are all they need to do is go buy a $10 bottle of iron. Yeah. Imagine suffering for years and then being told you just need One to day. buy a bottle of iron. And then they come back and they're like, I can't believe this. Like, ah. And you're like, yeah, it's that dumb. Sometimes it's that dumb. And so not everybody needs to go on thyroid hormone replacement, but obviously I'm able to coach anyone. And sometimes I work with people and their doctors as well. Of course, I can't prescribe medicine, but I can work with you and tell you what you need to do to talk with your doctor about possibly getting better and possibly directing your health in the right direction, having them practice medicine with you and try some things they might not otherwise. Um, the most important thing is if you have a thyroid issue, you have to arm yourself with knowledge um, because- likely you're going to be with a dumbass doctor and you might know more than them. And therefore you're going to be able to help you help yourself. I am the only one that fixed my thyroid problem two bouts in 10 years. That's a tragedy. I should not have had to do that. Yeah. I really shouldn't have. I'm well, glad that's I why did. We're all coaches, right? I mean, we all become these health coaches and practitioners that's right. because no one fixed us. We had to do it ourselves and do our own research because no one was figuring it out. Yeah, so, absolutely. Kind of so, I mean, I would just say, get your thyroid tested comprehensively mm -hmm. every year. I mean, if you test once and you don't have Hashimoto's, then you probably don't need to test for it again. But um, other than that, you should, I mean, my doctor tests all of these things I just mentioned for people that don't even complain of thyroid symptoms because he understands that the thyroid is the master gland and it is so important to make sure that's working right. If that's off, everything else is off. So then you got something else off over here and some doctor's patching oh that God. with something and that's not the patch job. The patch yeah. job, you needed to fix the thyroid. This happens all the time. So nutritionally, how do, can you, we help our hormone balance and get our thyroid and our hormones healthy? Just nutritionally getting fat adapted in an yeah. ancestral model is my favorite, of course. Uh -huh. But even if you're not eating off of a list of paleo foods and you're still eating grains and dairy and whatever, that's fine. I'd, I'd work on getting those macros right uh, or more correct uh, towards an ancestral sort of model. Um, there's really reasons for it. It's because, you know, here's the thing. It's because when you're, when your glucose is low and steady and when your sugar burner, you know, you eat and you're right, you're like blood sugar shoots up and then a couple hours go down and now your blood sugar drops. Your adrenals don't like that. They don't like when that happens. And so they, they respond to that. So if you're steady and low the whole day, which would be the model of an ancestral fat adapted fat burner then you're great, not only with anti-aging and longevity and all the other benefits of a paleo primal model, but really the most, um, the best soup to metabolize thyroid hormones, whether they're your own or whether you're taking them. Um, and so I do still adhere, and, and especially if you have Hashimoto's, we know for sure that gluten uh, triggers Hashimoto's antibodies. So if you have Hashimoto's or an autoimmune disorder, well, there's a reason paleo is so kind of perfect for so many things because it eliminates all of the offensive things. Mm -hmm. um, so I still believe in an ancestral model. Yeah. So do you, have you found over the years, have you switched? I know, you know, I've talked to Brad over the years about this, but going kind of paleo to primal ancestral health to more keto to more carnivore. Do you kind of mix it up and yeah, I mix it up. I've done a carnivore switches. experiment. I felt great, but I missed lettuce after like 20 days. I just missed let like the crunch. <laughs> um, however, if I had an autoimmune disorder, yeah, but pro probably do strict paleo AIP. And if that didn't work, I'd go to carnivore. I do have a couple of, uh, uh, clients who actually have autoimmune disorders and carnivore is the only thing that helps them. So thank God that that's there. Um, I'd say that at first I was eating way too much protein, way too much fat back in the day. And now I'm eating, I'm trying to eat more protein, less fat. Um, I think I've gone through all of them. Um, keto makes me fat. Now this can happen with people, you know, and again, it's, it's not that it'll make you fat like you, but your percentage of body fat. Mm -hmm. So I have also noticed like I go keto 
And it, it's not as great for me. Also high saturated fat, not as great for me and my genetics. So I focus more on olive oils and things like that. These are things I just had to learn over time that testing will kind of allude to. Um, but low carb is always when I feel great. Did always you do genetic testing. Any yes, I did genetic consumers? testing and all of that kind of stuff. The genetic testing was also helpful in that, like, I'm really more of a power lifter type of person. And what's interesting is that I really like compounded workouts, you know, where you're doing more than, and so learning that about myself, I get more benefits from weightlifting than I do, you know, like going on a three mile hike and Brad and Mark were like, Oh, you're never going to get fit. If you just keep going hiking, you could hike all fucking day long. And I didn't, you know, I didn't want that to be true. Uh, this is be honest here. Like, I did not want that to be true. I just wanted to go. I was, I'm good for hours of walking. I don't want to lift the weights. I don't want to do it. I don't want to <laughs> do it. I don't, but you know what? Um, I mean, I always kind of have, but I realized as I've gotten older, especially if you hit your forties, like I have, you're like, Oh shit, you have no choice, but to lift these weights. Nothing's gonna do it. Mm-hmm. Nothing's going to do it. And so I find that I have to do more weightlifting less cardio stuff, even though my cardio is chill, but I really have to do a lot more weightlifting to see results and feel great. And honestly, low carb is the way it is. So for example, let's say over the holidays, you go off the rails a little bit, have some cherry pie, have some bread or whatever. I mean, within a couple of days, I noticed the difference in my brain. Mm-hmm. brain I just function. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, so if I eat, if my first meal of the day is 12 or one, it's likely probably going to be like pure protein and maybe like a easy carb or a veggie or something. And then it's going to be simple. And then I'll eat like more of a bigger meal or more of that later. Mm-hmm. I can't handle, I don't like having a big meal in the middle of the day. My brain is on fire all day long, you know, but if I eat a heavy meal or eat some garbage or whatever, or eat too high carb, I do, I feel sleepy. It doesn't work with me. And I also was pre-diabetic at some point. I had a 5.7 HbA1c. Um, and I've, I've seen it fluctuate. Like I've gotten down to 5.2, which is you want to be 5.2 or below on the HbA1c if you're 4.8 brilliant. And then I noticed, you know, if I go above the carbs, even if I'm not eating a high carb diet, and even if it's not total crap, my HbA1c will creep right back up. I am definitely meant to live a low carb life. Does your genetics say that? Because mine say I'm I'm prone to insulin resistance. I yes, mine does say I'm prone to diabetes. Sensitive. Yeah, me too. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so I, t- but that doesn't mean I don't go go to town on some carbs or we'll have cake every night, you know, of course. But it's just, it's, it's so, I just noticed that my existence is so much better. My brain is so much better. My mood is so much better when I'm low carb. And then there are days where I am just carnivore. There is a day where I'll just eat meat. And then there'll be another day where maybe I don't eat any carbs or I eat, you know, a hundred carbs. And then maybe the next day it's 50. I like the, yeah. I like to switch it up. Uh, let's, uh, let's but switch it up, show the body that, Oh, Hey, we got a, we got a win. We hit a blueberry batch and we, you know, yeah. now we didn't. And so, uh, I think I would say I'm like keto ish, but I'm probably a lower fat keto than most people. But that's where I think one, I think it's individual and everyone's different. 100%. I love, I love how everyone's finally starting to say we need to switch it up because I've yes. always thought since you know, we started doing low carb back in 2005. And so we were doing all this before there was a word for OMAD and keto and all this. So it's been doing metabolic efficiency stuff for years. But so finally people are talking about cycling it in and out that I think it needs to be sustainable. And like you said, if you look at ancestral health, it wasn't, they didn't eat the same way all year long and there's seasons and, you know, looking at where you come from, look at your genetics There's so much to it. And then how, like even my training changes per season, like it's, we're recording this in January and I'm not biking as much and I might be doing different exercise and lifting more weights. And I think embracing changes in life and your activity level and all that, and not be set to like, I'm the same way all the time. And even a year, Paul check years ago taught us the four day rotation diet, you know, don't eat the same foods every day either. I think is beneficial as well as switching your fasting windows, switching your foods, macro ratios and mix it up. So it's nice to hear people are finally getting there. Well, the other thing I want to point out too, is that this is the thing, and I hated this about the days of like 
where everyone was a sugar burner and you had all these mixed messages like uh, eat one banana before you work out an hour. And then within an hour after you work out, you have to have a shit, you know, and you were like, what the fuck? I'm even hungry. What do I do? There's all these like rules because you kind of have to, your, your muscles will catabolize if you're a sugar burner and you don't kind of follow those rules. But we realized those are not applicable to us. This is, you know, everyone's like, eat the rainbow, have as shit as colorful yeah. as possible. Okay. I just want to throw this out there. This really, this really bothers me. I've wasted so much food trying to do that. You don't need to have a salad that has 500 colors in it, but how's your week looking? Maybe you eat chard on one day, broccoli the next, a sweet potato. How's your week looking? Let's look at it an ancestral overall. I think that that's fine. Yeah. That every day you don't have 20 different, be- just eat one of those a day then. So that's what I do. And then, you know, you're wasting less food, less money. And then you might not even be kind of down for that flavor in a couple of days. So I really shop and eat intuitively. Like when I'm craving, maybe I'm craving salmon for three days. I'm going to go to town on salmon. Sometimes I crave cucumbers out of nowhere, or it's a weird thing. I'll just go, I want that. And I'll go for it. I mean, unless it's, oh, I'm craving donut. You know what I mean? Sometimes I'll indulge, but you know what I mean? So I think that, and I think that this confuses a lot of people and they're trying to do too much with the food. Just make sure your week's a nice, colorful week. Yeah. Well, it's like you said, some days I don't, I used to always eat vegetables, by the way, back in the day, I thought salads, I was the healthiest person because I ate no right. fat and I, I didn't eat much protein and I ate just vegetables for all meals. And now I, like yesterday, we just had steak and I had some pickles and sauerkraut. <laughs> I was like, that's Love all it. I feel like, you know, just keeping it simple. Yeah. And by the I way, you can have a much- meal with just protein. Yeah. You, okay. you don't have to add all the things. Um, I mean, listen, if you're like an athlete or you're a bodybuilder, sure, you you might have to do more real tinkering with like each meal has to have this amount of macros and you got to be real sciencey about it. But for the most part, we're all out here living in this world. It's like, sometimes I just need a steak. That's enough. I don't need, yeah. I don't have to add vegetables to it. I don't want anything else. <clears throat> so I, I, I go by that and I just kind of look at my week and I go, have I had enough colorful stuff? Is there enough deep green stuff in here? And maybe your week was shit. Oh, well, you'll make up for the next one. How's your year? How's your month? Mm -hmm. I think that overall, that's the most important, uh, most important part of it. Yeah. And I I like what Dr. Gabrielle Leon's sharing a lot all over podcasts about protein and, and how important it is as we age and for athletes and for female athletes, pre-menopausal and menopausal that we need to you know, do less cardio, do more strength training and eat more protein. And she keeps it simple. Just whatever goal weight is say 120 pounds. I need to have 120 grams of protein a day. And what I was finding is that if people fast too much, there's no way you can eat that much at once. Cause you need 20 to 30 grams at once. But if you're doing a five hour eating window, you know, you're going to be eating for nonstop five hours. (laughs) And so that's like, when it gets to be, are you fasting too much that you can't, maybe you need to expand your fasting window when you're trying to do more protein and not do, you know, 20 hour fast with five hour eating window and trying to overindulge in five hours to get everything in. So that's why I think, I think it's getting confusing too out there with people fasting, but trying to get their protein and not just shove it all in at fast and overwhelm the body. (laughs) Right, right, right. So, but the importance of you know, strength training, as you're saying, and listen to your genetics. Cause I did, I always think this, if I could ever figure this out, cause we'll never know, but I did Ironmans for years and marathons and 50 K races and all that stuff. But my genetics, as I started to dive into them later in life, that's like, I'm more like 67 or 73% genetically prone for our, for endurance, not endurance for the power and like you said, and it's so funny, it's like, well, was I really screwing my hormones up, pushing myself doing endurance events? That's all I was doing years. was endurance until yeah. I found that out. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. And then you go by less is more. Maybe I should train based on my genetics, do shorter workouts, you know, just run 45 minutes instead of an hour and a half and do more intervals and do go to the gym or lift heavy things in the yard or whatever it might be. But I think, you know, what if we're not doing what our genetics are, are we causing additional sources of stress. So my adrenal exhaustion was partially because I was doing stuff that my body didn't like to do. So it's always interesting to look at the all. Possibly. I mean, if we look at other, so for example, like our genetics as humans say that we should be eating animals, right? Yeah. So the truth is, is that when you make the decision not to, so you're going against your genetics, then you run into problems, right? Unless you're supplementing with B12, unless you're doing these things. So I would, I would argue that maybe the same is here, like going against your particular genetics, 
uh, could be again, you know, detrimental if not washed out for. But I do know that I was an endurance person for so long and then had like dropped off the weights or, or did the weights, but was real like, ah, 10 of these, like the same thing every day. Didn't push myself, didn't care, you know, just kind of like, okay, I'm going to do these like five different work, you know, arm exercises and what, and I'll do a couple of machines. But now that I know what I know and I've experienced it and equals one. Yeah. I'm better off doing a 15 minute walk and then lifting weights for like 45 minutes or whatever that is, you know? Yeah. So I know for me that, and then the moment I stop lifting weights, if I go like a couple of weeks or whatever, I just, it's almost like immediate softy ugh, energy, everything's structural, everything's just off. So, um, weights are just really key, especially when you, you hit your late thirties, early forties. Well, just the last thing on that, I started lifting when I learned that years ago, my genetics, five to eight reps, not 10, 15, 20 reps. Most of my workouts, I go heavy and people ask like, how do you get your arms? I'm like, uh, I lift weights and don't do like 20 reps of everything and that don't do anything for my body. So I have to lift weights yes. that fatigue me by five reps and I'm not going to get big and bulky. I no, have you won't. And that's the right way to definition. go. Yeah. yeah. So don't be afraid ladies to work out and lift weights and get it off of the cardio machine. Yes. You're not going to get, <laughs> look, it would take so much. You'd have to be a professional bodybuilding endeavor type of situation to get really that big as a woman. Yeah. So. You have to work really hard at it. And no one who's just a normal person, unless you're really doing it, you're not going to accidentally get. Yeah. No, I know. All right. So Let's talk about where you, you've got a new show. You started, you, you're not doing the Primal Endurance podcast anymore. You're doing your own. LRAP yeah, show. Primal Blueprint, you know, was bought by Kraft Heinz. And so now they're doing Primal Kitchen. And so now they changed it to the Primal Blueprint podcast. Sorry, Primal Kitchen podcast, oh. uh, where the CEO of Primal Kitchen, Morgan Bueller, or sorry, Morgan Zanotti, she got married, uh, is hosting it. And occasionally Mark will come on there. And after about seven years of hosting Primal Blueprint, I finally was like, I'm going to do yeah. my own. You know, I can't obviously monetize a show that's not mine. And so, supporting someone else's career for so long and love to, because Mark is my mentor and I love him. So yeah, the L rush show episodes every Tuesday so far, I've just had guests and they're all topics from like a New York times, bestselling, like thriller author to someone who wrote a book about race to people who will stop in and talk about health occasionally. Um, but it's all meant to inspire, motivate, and educate. And then I will also start in this year, having some more solo episodes where I'm just talking about certain topics related to life coaching, confidence, you know, all the things that I work on. And then, yeah, you could just go to lrust.com. There's some free stuff there. Not only do I have a free thyroid guide, but I have a free audiobook. And the free audiobook is two guided meditations and two affirmation tracks. Um, so that's really great. And yeah, and then I think if you still look on my Instagram under free stuff, I have a manifestation journal that I published on Amazon and it's a six month journal, but I created a three month PDF that's interactive where you can like type into the PDF. So if you want three months of that, that's a manifestation journal for gratitude, confidence and law of attraction and self-esteem. So it's kind of covering all of those things. I'm so into manifesting and journaling and just gratitude. Yes. I just think it's so, I have all my clients do it. Like I, my husband and I'm like, Hey, what do you want to have happen and manifest that. And it's just so crazy how things work out. Cause I was doing that. And then the next day I have these like great opportunities come through in an email. Like that's crazy. So I it's think not it's crazy. Really you know, I've been studying it for a while. I'm probably going to do like a manifestation course or masterclass at some point. Cool. Um, and I do have some courses coming up. I'm going to do an automated thyroid course and a confidence course as well that, you know, I don't have to be there. Anyone can do it uh, take it. But obviously I coach people all over the world and all of these topics. So if anyone needs help with anything, whether it's life coaching and self-esteem and confidence to, I do mentor writers. So if you want to write a book, then I work one-on-one -on -one with people and we get that thing done. Um, and then I also, of course, will always probably coach people on thyroid for the rest of my life, just because that's something you now. So and I always keep those prices lower than everything else I do, because I know the struggle of how much money people spend trying to figure yeah. out a health problem. And I don't want anyone to be left out of uh, the ability to talk to me for that. So and I think that's an important thing to do as a health coach is that we let have some options for people that don't want to, aren't able to spend the thousands of dollars that you can with doing the lab testing. So I was doing yes. that for a long time and just, you know, eight years to figure out what's going on because I didn't have the money to do all the, the right lab tests right away, which I should have done if I had the right direction, but you know, just how to figure out how to afford it. And that sometimes you can work on a, well, my story is I 
could have done a lot more if I just changed my lifestyle. <laughs> so I always said it wasn't, uh, it wasn't total, all these to- doctors, totally. it was me. And until I finally, totally. thanks to COVID, changed my work schedule and started doing co- health coaching online and moved to San Diego from Seattle, I got rid of just that grind hours. Out well, you got hour. some sunshine going on. That's going to help your life. I know. That's Seattle, right. I could, I would murder myself if I. I've been wanting to move here for years, even though everyone's leaving because our wonderful right. governor, <laughs> California. But you I know, mean, I'm going to say I'm one sorry. thing about that. Everyone would be ripping on California. You know what? We fucking love it here. Don't want to hear anything about it. We all love it here. The majority, we have no problems with what's going on here. We don't care. Don't come here if you don't want it. It's already oh, no. populated. And then also to the, uh, yeah, the thing about like, you know, I'm going to, people will like, oh, I'm going to move to Texas or, you know, and then they get there and then they're like, they have some regrets because they realize, hey, the cost benefit analysis didn't really work out in their favor. They thought they'd be saving all this money, but there's other things. Um, however, there are a lot of people that have left California. I mean, look, I, I was a, I'm a victim of a natural disaster. I was in the middle of a fire in 2018. I've thought about leaving a million times because I do not like the fire threat that I face. I live in the middle of mountains. It, it, you have to leave your phone on every night. You cannot turn it on silent because you might miss evacuation alert. And like, it's not really a great thing. You know, uh, could I move somewhere else in California away from fire danger? Totally. Um, but yeah, I know people are always like, oh, California. And we're like, we love it here. We fucking love it. Like, I don't, I've been here 27 years. I don't have any complaints. <laughs> yeah, nice. Well, that's how we are. You know, I'm in the mountains, but 20 minutes to the beach. Solana Beach is my kind of my hood. And Great beach. Go to Del Mar and Sanitas and, you know, to spend all my time up in North County. And it's definitely worth the the happiness, the the quality of life move, we call it. So I think, you know, going back oh, to it's so it all together. Good. Yeah. Stress. And I'm enjoying the pandemic here. I mean, honestly, one of the gifts of California in the pandemic is we can be outside year round. I know that's why I'm like, no, there's nothing normal that, or, uh, we're not doing anything different. We do it all this, if there was a pandemic or not. <laughs> so exactly. So that's been a godsend. I mean, I, I understand. I know what winters are like, cause I'm from downtown Chicago. So if you're out there and I feel bad, if you're living in this pandemic and somewhere you have to be inside, I totally know yeah. how claustrophobia and shitty that would be, but, uh, hang in there, everyone. And <laughs> Uh, all right. Awesome. Thanks for your time today, your energy and following your passion and your purpose. It's so great. And I'm excited to listen to your podcast and we'll put all the links in the show notes. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the low carb athlete podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at Debbie You can help us to continue to grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.